Okay, great. So here we are. So hello, everyone. Uh, this is Shannon Vance Ocampo. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I am the General Presbyter of the Presbytery of Southern New England. And this is Connecting Our Conversations, our podcast space for conversations that push the edges of our faith and help us to deepen discipleship. The Presbytery of Southern New England is a regional governing body in the Presbyterian Church USA. And today for our podcast, I'm talking with the Reverend John Mers, who is the Chief Executive Officer for Ad Advancing Connecticut Together. And that organization with its partners addresses root causes of poverty, addiction, and health inequities through strength-based services and advocacy to ensure all people in Connecticut have equitable resources necessary to achieve multi-generational health, wealth, and happiness. And their vision is to see a future where their neighbors thrive in an equitable society. John serves as their CEO, and this is his validated ministry as a minister member in our presbytery. And we thought it would be great to invite John to be on our podcast for today, December 1st, 2023, which is also World AIDS Day, which we have been honoring around the world since 1988. Globally, of course, we know that HIV and AIDS has affected tens of millions of people worldwide, either through infections or death. And many people today continue to live with AIDS. Um, it may seem like um, things are being handled and conquered from our place here in the United States, um, but HIV and AIDS remains one of the most serious public health issues uh, globally. And so John has been involved in this ministry in the HIV um, an AIDS community. And so we thought it would be great to have him be here with part of it. As I've been thinking, John, about uh, World AIDS Day and uh, what it means to me, I've been thinking about, uh, you know, how HIV and AIDS has impacted me and impacted my own life. I'm a child of the 80s and 90s. So um, my memory is always that AIDS was all that was uh, talked about in school, especially in our health classes. Uh, I remember health education um, essentially being don't have sex, you'll get AIDS and die and be an embarrassment to your family. That was sort of the sum total of um, our health education uh, that I remember from when I was in middle school and high school, which of course was not um, a very good message to share and a very appropriate message to share. Um, I remember so much stigma and shame around uh, the disease, but I also uh, remember being young and knowing many people with HIV and AIDS as I was growing up. Um, many people I remember uh, during the time that I was a child, an adolescent, and even in college, a lot of families tried to shield their children, young adults, teenagers, from the reality of HIV and AIDS and from people themselves uh, who had the disease or family members who um, were family members of people who had HIV and AIDS. That was not something that happened in my household growing up. My mom worked in the arts community in Philadelphia. And so it was talked about regularly in my household. And um, I knew people, um, mostly friends of my parents um, who had contracted HIV and um, were, were struggling. And uh, it, these were people that were not kept out of my life, but were very much a part of my life growing up. Um, my One of my most important memories is in 1996, um, a friend of my father's from college who uh, was a gay man and an attorney uh, took my college and high school youth group uh, to Washington, D.C. to see the HIV uh, memorial, the AIDS quilt, uh, as it was laid out on the National Mall in D.C. And that was the last time they were able to lay out the AIDS quilt as one unified uh, quilt on the National Mall it was going to be too big uh, after that. And that trip had such a profound impact on me, made a huge impression, helped me to see the variety of stories and the varieties of people that were living with this disease and family members, and also to see um, a lot of the, the pain that was going on at that time in the gay community um, around being um, really shunned by family and uh, friends. 
And then I also um, remember one of my beloved youth group leaders from growing up um, who even used to babysit for my brother and I, when my parents would travel. And he was closeted for many years, very afraid. And that led to all sorts of issues in his life, including addiction. Um, he was this incredible, joyful, loving person and uh, ended up um, getting into uh, therapy, into 12 step programs before he passed away of AIDS, but he was able to go through that process of making amends. And I was lucky that he was one of the people that uh, called me and spoke with me. And so that I was able to, um, to get to talk to him and have that important conversation with him. Um, that was very powerful for me when I was growing up. And I've also been able to see some of the international work uh, of the church around this. So these are some of the things I just, you know, sort of stream of consciousness a little bit here at the beginning of the podcast, John, about some of my own memories around HIV and AIDS. And I'm wondering if you could share uh, some of those as I've framed up what it's been like a bit in my life and my growing up and using that as a springboard for you to share some of uh, what has been important to you and what got you invested and involved in HIV uh, ministry, AIDS ministry for uh, for your career uh, really at this point uh, in ministry. So go ahead and talk a little bit about some of that, John. Hi, Shannon. Thanks for having me on uh, World AIDS Day, timely, December 1st, uh, every year. Uh, we talk about HIV AIDS for 24 hours, and then uh, it goes back to the uh, back burner, the last page of the newspaper. And um, we continue to do the work, of course, 365 days a year. So it's interesting you ask how I got involved low these many years ago. So there I was, a poor, struggling uh, seminarian. And uh, the year was 1983. I needed a work study program. And they said, hey, you can volunteer for a local nonprofit instead of washing dishes in the mess hall. And you put in your hours and you get your work study pay. And I'm like, oh, that's a great thing. <clears throat> and somebody suggested that I work at an organization called AIDS Project New Haven. And I was like, well, what is that? And they're like, well, you know, HIV AIDS, that disease that's affecting gay men. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. So um, not only was I in the closet around my sexuality at that point in time, but I was also in the closet as it related to like world health issues like HIV AIDS. So lo and behold, I got involved. Um, and in that process and during seminary, realized that I, in fact, am a gay man. So it was um, important that my community uh, be supported. And uh, so um, I also realized that I couldn't go into parish ministry because at that time the church was not supportive of uh, open gay and lesbian people. So I was like, well, what can I do to do ministry, support my gay community, but also have a paycheck that's not uh, reliant on the institutional church? So those many, many years ago, I uh, got involved in the AIDS movement, first as an intern uh, with work study, then as a volunteer. And my first job was actually in 1988, in Hartford with the grassroots organization AIDS Project Hartford. You may recall that back in the day, there were all kinds of uh, grassroots organizations springing up around the country. <clears throat> Many of them took the name AIDS Project, insert uh, town or city name after that. So in 1988, I got involved in uh, uh, AIDS Project Hartford. And then there was an organization that was founded called AIDS Ministries Program, which was created to uh, work with the religious communities to have a compassionate and informed response to HIV AIDS. So I became their uh, executive director in 1992. And that's actually the ministry that I was uh, ordained to do because it was uh, related to the church. <clears throat> Six years later, um, I became involved with an organization called the Connecticut AIDS 
uh, residence coalition. So we were focused on um, AIDS housing that morphed into Connecticut AIDS Resource Coalition because a lot of those grassroots organizations fell by the wayside as eventually did the AIDS Ministries. So this organization found itself picking up the pieces of a lot of the different niche uh, organizations. So we became Connecticut AIDS Resource Coalition. We then merged with um, AIDS Project to uh, become uh, AIDS Connecticut. And then uh, we merged again recently with an organization to become Advancing Connecticut Together. So the reason I sort of tell that in an arc way is that this organization's roots are actually founded in AIDS Project Hartford, which means I've only had one real job for the last 35 years, but I keep reinventing <laughs> uh, the organization so that it feels like it's new. <clears throat> so actually um, in the uh, organization that I'm a part of now, I've been with it for 25 years, as I say, okay. in different iterations. And a lot has changed, as you uh, suggested in your opening comments, that um, there's a lot more acceptance, people are not dying uh, like they used to, but we still have a lot of work ahead of us I think mostly because we live in a society of sound bites and quick fixes, and uh, it didn't take long with the COVID pandemic for us to like be so over masks. I look at a mask now, I'm like, wait a minute, I lived my life in this for two years and it feels so long ago. And mm -hmm. uh, even with the insurgence of that uh, virus, people are like, oh, you know, that's so last year. Well, yeah. that same feeling is uh, surrounding the uh, AIDS epidemic. It's so last year. It's so 1980s. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. Like, we want things to just be better quickly. And we like, we don't like problems that linger in our society. I don't think we want to be able to fix things. And uh, my husband and I, we went and we got our uh, our COVID boosters on Saturday and, you know, we scheduled it like a week ago and we were waiting to time those boosters a little later in the season because of some travel we're doing. So we feel like we're going to be at higher risk, you know, being on planes and things. Mm. And um, he had really he had a really bad reaction over the weekend to his shot. I had sort of a mild reaction. I was just really sleepy all day Sunday to my shot. And he he was saying yesterday, he's like, I'm never getting another one of these boosters again. And I was thinking, this is crazy. Like, what? look at what we just went through. Like, we couldn't see anyone for almost two years and our work lives were so disrupted. And we're like, and I know he'll go and get the shot next week. And if he listens to this podcast, I'm not shaming my husband. But like, I just, it's amazing, as you said, like how quickly we are to just be like, I'm never doing this again, right. forget. And like, we went through so much with that pandemic and we didn't go through shutdowns and all of that in the early days of AIDS, but it has been a constant pandemic. I, I think we forget that about AIDS is that we've been in a pandemic situation with AIDS for decades and it's gotten, we've kind of gotten so um, inured to it right. here, especially because of the advances of medicine uh, but it is, it is still very, pre you know, prevalent and, uh, um, and I know there's, you know, people now take prep, uh, and all sorts of other things. There's the medical advances have been significant, but it doesn't mean that they're not difficult. Um, and, uh, especially depending on who you are socioeconomically issues of access, it's really become in my mind AIDS, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like AIDS has become such an issue of um, economics and uh, class and privilege and health disparities and insurance access and all of this um, much more than anything else. If yes. that, that that's the way it feels to me today versus when I was growing up. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's definitely a disease of poverty. And uh, in fact, that's part of the reason we merged with uh, anti-poverty organization because the crossover, the Venn diagram was just so significant. We were serving the same people uh, who were recently released from incarceration, 
uh, at risk or having HIV, not having uh, a economic uh, foundation in their lives. So um, yes, it's all very intertwined. Just wanted to uh, let folks know you are well versed in it, but PrEP means pre-exposure prophylaxis, which means that folks can take a pill uh, to prevent HIV AIDS if they find themselves in uh, situations where they might expose themselves. I think the other uh, big thing that happened at least in Connecticut recently in the last year or so is that there, we, they are making routine HIV testing a part of every doctor's visit so that you have to opt out and say, no, I don't want it, as opposed to opting in and saying, hey, can I have that uh, HIV test? So I think we're normalizing it, which I think is great. We're normalizing the fact that people are living longer and with less uh, symptoms than in the early days. But if you think about the numbers, so back in you know, 1981, when they first discovered the virus, we're talking about five people and it made the cover of Newsweek and Time Magazine and everyone was all, uh, you know, up in arms. And now we've got like 62,000 people still becoming infected every year in the United States. And we're like, oh, ho hum, no, like that's just, uh, uh, that disease that continues. And I think there's still so. And it's uh, not just that disease. I mean, it's, you know, COVID was, uh, if you get long COVID, of course, that's a different game. But COVID sort of in and out of your system, usually within a week or two, um, you might have some nasty symptoms, be tired. But and that was so disruptive to so many people on the spread and the infection rate. But you get AIDS, it's it's you have it for the rest of your life. And it can be controlled so much more today with, you know, what we can do in terms of treatment is so much better, but that doesn't mean it's a good thing. And that doesn't mean right. it doesn't lead to problems in terms of quality of life and, and other things. And it doesn't mean there still isn't shame um, around it uh, that's and stigmas associated with it uh, still. So it's, it's uh, like you said, it's amazing that there is this sort of, you know, real sort of like a whatever attitude mm -hmm. around it. And um, and I, it's also a, a celebration that things like having an HIV test as part of your normal routine blood work that you get annually, you know, that used to be a box you had to check. And yeah. and I think that some of that was, it became legally, um, it, it became illegal to discriminate based on that. And it used to be that if you tested positive, you know, you could, that could be a basis of discrimination. And so, but it, you know, that, that was a big change. Um, but even today, I know that it's uh, because my husband is an immigrant, of course, we had to go through HIV AIDS testing when he was becoming a U.S. citizen in the first few years of our marriage. And if you tested positive, that was a barrier to citizenship mm. in the U.S. And uh, so that, that was something they were using that as one of the reasons to deny, um, you know, visas entry into the United States. And this was, this was back in the early 2000s, this was going on. Oh, so yeah, it's, it's very frustrating, the yeah. legacy of discrimination and non-science based actions that mm -hmm. the society have taken. Just as early as this year, the uh, Red Cross and the blood banks have finally Correct allowed uh, folks who have been sexually active to donate blood. And that was never from early, early on was not based in any kind of science. They were screening the blood pool um, almost since right. the, the beginning and yet Correct. still held this arbitrary uh, and homophobic uh, Mary. rule in place. So yeah, we've come a long way and I'm very grateful for all <laughs> of that. Um, I think that we've tried really hard to teach people about disease is a disease as opposed to a moral condemnation. Exactly. Uh, I think we've done a good job there. I, I don't think we saw nearly as much, uh, if any, of that stigma associated with COVID. But so this um, fairly new minor uh, epidemic called MPOX, 
formerly monkeypox. We changed the name because talk about racist. Uh, yeah, terrible connotations. Um, you know that that started to feel a little bit like mm -hmm. there was some stigma and homophobia attached to that. Now we've only had what um, thirty one thousand cases in the United States, but. You know, that's still percolating under the uh, radar that they just had their first case in, I think, Indiana. Um, mm. So it's it's there. And I'm hoping that we don't see that resurgence of uh, stigma because it uh, is associated with sex and, dare I say, sweaty dancing on yes. the dance floor. You know, so... Um, that terrible stuff that happens at nightclubs, right? Yes, I know. So... <laughs> You know, the verdict is out in terms of whether we have uh, yeah. turned the corner as it relates to uh, you know, like treating disease as moral judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and of course, the church's complicity in that is extreme. I mean, the church has played um, in some ways some really beautiful roles around the AIDS epidemic. But overall, on balance, the church is in the negative, I would say, because they have significantly contributed to the stigmatizing there, you know, the church is still seen as a deeply homophobic uh, space, even though you and I serve in one of the progressive parts of the church. But, um, but we even know that the, you know, where we are today in the Presbyterian Church USA, where we have open ordination and marriage, these were hard won battles, you know, it took mm -hmm. decades and decades, and it took um, it, we lost a lot of people that left and just couldn't put up with us anymore. And we wounded and harmed a lot of people. Folks like you have never served in a local parish, uh, because of that, uh, discrimination in the church and have suffered a whole bunch of other indignities that we won't go through on this podcast <laughs> because of it, you know? So, I mean, it's, we don't need to sort of list them out, but it is, it is a problem. And so I'm curious what, how you see your role as an ordained Christian minister in cutting through that stigma and that shame and proclaiming a different sort of message and also providing people a very different view of what a minister is, what a pastor is. People are probably still shocked today when they find out you're a minister and, well, and, yeah, they, and or they people are. meet you and say, oh my gosh, I shouldn't curse or, you know, yes. <laughs> <they turn> that <laughs> to all sorts of other things. But, you know, what is, um, you know, what's that like and what, what has been that, that part of ministry for you? Cause I can imagine that you bring something to people that they may have never experienced before, which is a different kind of minister. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's um, humbling and holy to be able to sort of cross that chasm between uh, the loving church that I believe I'm a part of and a group of people that have been so harmed by institutional churches to be able to say like, hey, there's a part of the church that is good and I represent that and I reflect back to them their own sexuality that I think is very important. So um, yeah, it's, it's a special place to be, a special walk to walk. Um, I'm usually the one who says, you know, hey, 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 I'm a, like, I'm a Presbyterian minister, but don't hold that against the church because my, you know, my mouth is like a truck driver <laughs> um, and they, they laugh. But I think, you know, again, we sort of done a disservice to yes. the ministry when we've held ourselves higher than humanity yeah. and said, oh, like, you know, I bestow on you the blessings of the church as opposed to we're brothers and sisters in arms in the trenches. And um, yeah. I just have a, a, a word of good news to share with you. Right. Like, yeah. We're just human beings like everyone else. Um, I but, think it has yeah. informed my theology, which is um, my sermons are always the same sermon, which is God loves you. I mean, nothing can separate us from God's love. God loves you. So uh, the challenge of preaching, of course, is how do you say that um, 52 different ways through the course of the, the year? But I think that really working with people with HIV AIDS and sitting with them as they died, it um, it yeah. just really underscores that we have a loving creator who mm -hmm. uh, 
really says nothing separates us from the love of God, even HIV AIDS. So right. that's what keeps me going. Yeah. Well, and I think also, I just want to say that the ministry you've been doing has also been bringing others along, right? Because uh, alongside the ministry you've been doing that has had all these different names and titles uh, with different organizations, you know, sort of the same ministry, but the evolution of this work in the AIDS community as the disease has evolved, as society has evolved, but also the the sort of two parallel, the parallel track we run in the Presbyterian Church of whatever our particular ministry that we get paid for is, be it a validated ministry like yours or parish ministry, whatever that is. And then the track of um, our work amongst our colleagues in the presbytery. And so, you know, because of that, I think this presbytery has been more attuned and known more about HIV and AIDS. And also you've had an opportunity to have some very deep relationships with a few congregations in this presbytery and, you know, they see you as a pastor in some ways, as one of their pastors, as sort of their team. And so, uh, you know, that that has also, I think, you know, played an important role in this, you know, sort of ever opening, you know, continuing to bring more light into our, you know, church that needs it as well um, has also happened. Has there been any particular experiences like that in local church ministry that have been really important for you along the way? Well, I just, I have to confess that um, having felt a little bruised by the institutional church Absolutely. and yet um, providing ministry to them, uh, you'll recall that I was the stated supply, pair, you know, like pulpit supply for Granby, Massachusetts for, I, I was there pretty much seven years straight every Sunday preaching out of their uh, pulpit. And I've always been a little um, cautious to sort of talk about who I am as a gay man from the pulpit because of the institutional church. And um, you may recall that at one point I was brought up on charges for mm -hmm. being in a um, gay relationship and being a self-professing homosexual. You got married, isn't that I got awful? married, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think actually what I was brought up on charges for was at being open and uh, affirming. Yeah. The minister who married me also got in trouble for marrying a gay couple. But there I was in front of my little congregation in Granby, Massachusetts, with fair and trepidation the Sunday morning after mm. the court uh, ruling and that I was um, found not guilty. And I just felt um, like I needed to share a hundred percent of myself with this loving congregation mm. of maybe 25 or 30 people at the time. And um, so I basically came out to them and it was the most loving outpouring yeah. of non-judgmental, yeah. just Christianity that I have ever witnessed. And you might, as I do, I prejudge. So I'm up at the pulpit and I'm sharing this story and I'm shaking and I'm scared. And I look yeah. out and I see one or two guys and I'm like, these two older gentlemen and they're gonna nail me they're gonna okay. just that you like if they don't walk out of the church this morning i'm never gonna see them even mm -hmm. if you know if they don't make a stink and both of them came up to me one of them with tears in his eyes uh he had uh, a gay brother who never felt welcome in, in the institutional church and he just wanted me to know how important it was for me to be there and the other guy this rough gruff uh military guy cute story he's like john don't you remember i ran into you in the streets of new hope pennsylvania with your boyfriend bill at the time who's now your husband he's like we've known all this time what are you like being all afraid of and i was like okay so this is <laughs> <laughs> so one, God has a sense of humor, you know, and two, that did you ask him what he was doing in New Hope? Or? <laughs> well, he was with his wife at the time, and 
you know, but you, you just have to laugh because God yeah. really does have a sense of humor. And, and the congregation was so loving. And really, I have almost, um, except for one or two uh, people uh, in our presbytery has felt a hundred percent welcome, a hundred percent supported. And um, yeah, I guess I'd like to think that um, they're like, well, you know, if John's one of them, they can't be half bad, or I don't know what goes through people's heads, but um, <laughs> it, it has been warm. Uh, the, the, the presence or, you know, the collegiality that I felt in this presbytery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, we've been through so much in the church and we're all uh, carrying varying levels of PTSD, I think from that time. And, uh, but also just really committed to continuing to open up the space because it's not fully open yet. So we have to keep, we have to keep, you know, pushing, pushing on those things. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more uh, going back to the, um, to AIDS Connecticut and now um, advancing Connecticut together. So like what's happening today in our region, mostly the greater Hartford region of Connecticut, which is part of our Presbytery bounds, like what's happening sort of on the street today in terms of advocacy, in terms of um, things that we need to be thinking about, what's going on in terms of, I know you all do needle exchanges and other work, you know, what's the What's the day-to-day -day work today in 2023 in Central Connecticut for um, serving the community um, that has HIV AIDS or the community around that community? Interestingly, it hasn't really changed that much since the early days. I mean, back in the day, we were cutting edge, right? So we were doing syringe services and uh swapping out used uh, syringes for unused syringes. We continue to do that. Um, it's just not cutting edge anymore. Although I have to say with the opioid epidemic uh, coming to the fore, folks are starting to suddenly think of like, oh, harm reduction, that's an important concept. Oh, maybe we should meet people where they are instead of meeting them at the morgue. So um, I, I think that we have, uh, we have some lessons to share with people. We continue to uh, meet people who are newly diagnosed, uh, connect them to medical care. We know that if they're connected, the chances of them progressing or having symptoms is low. We make sure that they have the resources for medication. We know that folks can't be uh, stable in their medical world if they're not stable with housing, food, uh, utilities. So we make sure that folks as far and as much as we're able have a solid economic foundation from which to live. Um, I think sort of nationally and slash internationally, we're, uh, we're fighting some uh, stigma that um, has raised its ugly head in the past couple, four to six years. Uh, one of the things that concerns me a lot is that the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, uh, nicknamed PEPFAR, um, has done so much. It estimates that it's saved 25 million lives throughout the world. It's really one of our best uh, international um activities that we do as the United yeah. States, not that a lot of people know about that. It's got to be reauthorized every five years, and it's now being used as a, a political pawn because people are saying that, you know, three steps removed from this funding, it could possibly be used to facilitate abortion access, which is not even true, and there are safeguards in the law itself that don't allow that to happen, but some extreme right-wing groups are um, trying to make this part of their anti-abortion soapbox. And so I'm concerned about that because really millions of people in uh, especially Africa, which is the continent that still continues to be disproportionately affected, um, could really suffer uh, right. if folks 
in their ignorance get their way. I mean, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, I feel like um, HIV AIDS is like whack-a-mole. If you don't sort of focus on all of the different areas and if you let up for just a little bit, there's going to be a resurgence. And so that's why we continue in Connecticut and uh, Greater Hartford more specifically, why we're out there day in, day out, day in, day out, because if you let off the break for even a little bit, we know that there are spikes in infection. And now um, even more so if we let off the break uh, or the gas as it relates to uh, PEPFAR and um, our support of the uh, rest of the world. Because, you know, if if we ignore it, it's just going to come back to uh, roost on us eventually. So that, that's that got me concerned. Um, again, at, I'm happy that there are lessons that we can share with the opioid pandemic and hopefully um, sort of reduce the stigma remind people that uh, addiction is an illness that needs to be treated and it's not a moral weakness mm -hmm. or failure. So, you know, that's what keeps me going. What's exciting on the horizon in terms of research? And uh, I know, you know, we have this, you know, long hope for vaccine, uh, uh, I always think to myself how exciting it would be if we were able to find a vaccine. I know there's been some trials, but uh, what's what's exciting on that? Well, I, I, I think we'll get there. I think one uh, some of the um, injectables that are longer lasting than even uh, one a day pills. I think that that is going to go a long way. Um, you know, again, sort of glass empty, glass half full. I'm excited, but uh, just sort of our healthcare system and our insurance system, right. who's going to pay for this. I know there was a big fight around um, PrEP because it doesn't actually treat a disease. So why is the insurance company paying for something that's not uh, disease related, not able to see their um, in front of themselves, you know, that. Well, I mean, then why pay for everybody to get their cholesterol checked? I mean, it's, I it's sort of a ridiculous argument, but that's just yeah. me and my thoughts. <laughs> no, that's, yep. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I, I think we are making strides with sort of the medication. It's less toxic. It's going from one pill a day to injections or patches and, so that that makes me happy. Um, I still think we're failing in getting the message to the populations that need it: low-income African American uh, men who have sex with men. Um, that continues to sort of be a pocket uh, that we haven't done a good job of reaching. Um, you know, and I think. Um, that the federal government gets it enough that regardless of who's in the White House, that uh, we won't dismantle a really good, well-oiled machine. And so that gives me some hope as I stare down the um, proverbial barrel of the upcoming election. Yes. Uh, yeah, we're all thinking about the next 12 months a great deal. And what do we need to do as the church? Where do we need to be as the church? How do we position ourselves? These are such important questions for us right now. Certainly something that we've been thinking about, I know in the Presbytery, but it's a, it's a question we should all be thinking about is how do we get ahead of things no matter what happens? Um, yep. How do we be, how do we be the church, right? How do we be the church? So, so on that happy note, John, <laughs> well, yes. No, thank yes. you for your time. No, no, no. But I, tell us anything else you want to tell us about World AIDS Day. Anything else you want to share with us as we close out uh, this really fascinating conversation? Just anything else you want to tell us? Um, well, if if folks are interested in what I do, or I'm sure that somewhere on our website we've got a calendar of events. It's www. Act act hyphen ct.org so act-ct.org 
Uh, we've got all kinds of resources. Uh, we've got all kinds of divisions where we brand our uh, harm reduction, our HIV AIDS services, our anti-poverty stuff. We've got a whole on uh, online resource for things LGBTQ. So if folks need those kind of resources, uh, feel free to go to our website. And if they're interested in chatting with me, they can hit me up at jmers at act-ct.org. That's my email. And um, uh, again, just want to thank you for this time. Thank yeah. the Presbytery for supporting my ministry. And just want to apologize for any of the dings or bells that you heard in the background, because as most of our computers, I'm connected to <laughs> the internet and my messaging. And so um, throughout uh, the- Well, these, thank you. These, I had to so. remember to put my focus on. I had forgotten to do that one little thing that you do to turn off all the machines, right? right? So we'll can you say again, John, is that is that um, reauthorization up right now in Congress or is it about to come up I'm, uh, that you had mentioned the president? Yeah, it's actually, it was supposed to uh, be up in September okay. and it's installed. And so they've got some money that's um, lingering that they're keeping okay. body and soul together. But yeah, it's definitely um, something that folks should uh, reach out to their elected officials about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll put some information about that in the show notes. You can send me a link. And okay. um, uh, it sounds like a really good action alert, actually, for our Washington office in D.C. So after we finish this podcast, we should talk about that and uh, get them sending a blast to all the Presbyterians uh, that they send those things to and make it so easy to connect with your elected representatives. So thank you for the link. So yeah. we'll put that in the show notes. And thank you, John, for your ministry. Um, thank you for decades of uh, work, which I know has included a great deal of heartache um, and pain, but also a great deal of joy and opportunities for the inbreaking of the spirit into places it would not have gotten to um, had you not been engaged in this ministry and answered God's call to it. So thank you uh, so much for all of that. And um, I wish you blessings and blessings upon all you serve um, on this World AIDS Day. So thank you, John. Thanks, Shannon. Take care, everyone.